Amen. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, who was and is and is to come. My name is Joey Reed. I'm privileged to be the pastor here at Mayfield First United Methodist Church, and we are so glad that you have chosen to join us here today via Facebook Live or on WYMC AM and FM and Internet. If you are joining us later on in the week by by YouTube, we welcome you, and we assume that you are worshiping with us no matter what the boundaries of time and space may be. God supersedes each of those things. Please let us know that you are here with us today. If you're watching on Facebook Live, let us know in the comments section. If you're watching any other way, please send us an email or uh, use the contact page at our website at mayfieldfirst.com. You can also leave prayer requests through that contact page or you can leave a prayer request in the comments section below. We're always happy to hear from you. Just let us know how we can join you in praying for you and praying with you. Today, we're especially praying for those who are suffering from COVID-19. We pray that the vaccinations are rolling out faster and faster. We pray that uh, you're still taking care of yourselves and, and being safe wherever you are. And as we look towards the end of this pandemic, we hope that the end is near, at least nearer than it was. Uh, today, we are also lifting up one of the churches here in the Purchase District. This week's church is Arcadia, and Mrs. Sherry bosco Lightly is the pastor there, the person who is taking care of that congregation and bringing the word faithfully. So our prayers join with yours. The candle on your right, my left, has been lit to represent that church and her pastor. Our shout-outs today uh, start with Kent Hunt. We miss you, Kent, and we hope that you're listening today and that everything's going all right. Hope to talk to you soon. Our next shout out is for our school administrators and support staff, all the folks who are helping to make sure all the things that need to happen are happening, especially the folks who are taking care of all the new technology that everybody's wrestling with. And our last shout out for the day is for Mayor Kathy Onan, one of our own, and for all the employees of the city of Mayfield. You have led well, and we thank you for all of the things that you are doing, that you continue to do, and for the good things that are even now on the way. We're so glad that you've chosen to join us for worship this morning. Our prayer to open worship is for all of us to pray. Make sure that you are engaging with the service today and not just observing, not just watching. Uh, The sermon will touch a little bit on that today. But as we pray, pray together through our opening prayer led by Greg Knight. Good morning, my name is Greg Knight and welcome. Please join me for the opening prayer which is found in the online bulletin at mayfieldfirst.com. You call us to proclaim your deeds and your wonders to all people. You call us to worship and serve you that all may be made whole. You offer us a new life of righteousness. Make us worthy, O Lord, to receive all your gifts. Descend on us like the light of a new day. Give light to our souls and put your praise upon our lips. Amen. God of grace and God of glory, on thy people for thy power, crown thine ancient church's story. Bring her blood to glorious power. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. For the facing of this hour. Lo, the hosts of evil around us scorn thy Christ assail his way. Wisdom, grant us courage, 
Jesus, we miss thy kingdom's goal. Lest we miss thy kingdom's Please join us for the affirmation from 1 Timothy, which is found in the online bulletin at MayfieldFirst.com. There is one God, and there is one mediator, Christ Jesus, who came as a ransom for all, to whom we testify. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners and was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in throughout the world, taken up in glory. Great indeed is the mystery of the gospel. Amen. We continue our service of worship with a moment of prayer. I want to invite you to listen for a, just a brief moment before the pastoral prayer as we pray together, remembering those things that God has placed upon our heart, remembering those things that bother us deeply, remembering those things that we are celebrating. Lift up your spirit before Almighty God as we listen even now for the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. Gracious God, we give thanks for the many blessings of this life. We give thanks for the fact that when we were broken, you made us whole. We give thanks for the option to grow. We give thanks for the things that you have made available to us in our lives. This, the number of blessings is overwhelming, oh God. And sometimes we forget just how blessed we are. Teach us what it means to chase after your son, Jesus Christ to follow his example, and to become in all things. Remind us that our lives are not just good because we've made good choices all the time, but because we have had good choices from which to choose. Remind us that not everyone has that option and that not everyone has good choices. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would help us to change this world, to transform the world around us by transforming ourselves through the power of your Holy Spirit as we allow you in to make us new, transform this world so that all your children might find a home in Jesus Christ. For we ask this in his name. We pray this in his name, remembering that he gathered disciples to himself and taught them to pray with these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. the sun. 
sunshine and the rain. He sends the harvest golden grain. Sunshine and rain, harvest of grain. He's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me. I want no better friend. I trust him now. I'll trust him when life's fleeting day he shall end. Beautiful life with such a friend. Beautiful life that has no end. Eternal life, eternal joy. He's my friend. Good morning, I'm John Gallion. The first scripture this morning is from Isaiah, the 40th chapter, the 21st through the 31st verses. You can follow along on the online bulletin at mayfieldfirst.com. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught, and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth, when he blows upon them, and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me? Or who is my equal? Says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Thanks be to God and thanks John for reading scripture for us today. We continue now with the giving and receiving of God's tithes and our gifts. Not always the same thing. Our tithes are the covenant that we have made with God to give a portion of what we bring in, the things that we have been blessed, uh, with which we have been blessed by God. If you don't have a tithe covenant, that's okay. You might even be a part of another church, and if you are, know that whatever covenant you've made belongs at that church. Make sure you're honoring your covenant where you made that covenant. If you don't have a tithe agreement anywhere, today might be a good day for you to give just something to show how much you love God, something that is a token of your esteem, something that is a symbol of your sacrificial desire to serve and love God. There are several ways to do that through the pandemic. The three ways that we have that we want to bring to your attention. First, online at mayfieldfirst.com. Just click on the giving tab. We have an encrypted method for you to give there. Your financial in, uh, information is safe, and you can use that tab at any time, not just on Sunday mornings. You can also make a setting there that will allow you to repeat your gift weekly or monthly or quarterly. You can also text the word PROMISE to 73256, and that will start a, uh, an interaction between you and an encrypted uh, server so that you can share financial information through your cell phone, your smartphone, as long as you are able to send and receive texts. And as always, you can simply mail a gift to Mayfield First UMC at 214 South 8th Street, Mayfield, Kentucky 42066. 
And I want to remind you that not every gift is financial. There's the gift of your time, your talents, your resources. And one example of the way that we share our gifts and resources is to serve during the worship service. And today, Gary Jaton sings for us the hymn of promise. As our gifts have been brought before Almighty God, our gifts of song, our gifts of finance, our gifts of time, talent, resource, we give now to God our doxology. Our next scripture reading comes from the first collection of letters written to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 9, 16 through 23, the New Revised Standard Version. Hear now the word of the Lord. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward, but if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation I may make the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessings. 
the word of God. For you who are the people of God, thanks be to God. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Things have changed so much just in the last year. We have endured things that we could not have imagined if you had told me a year ago that we would be doing this the way we're doing things today. I don't know that I would have bought it. If you had told me when I was in middle school that I would be pastoring a church, I can tell you right now I wouldn't have bought it. So many things change looking around and watching our faces change. It happens slowly and we don't necessarily see it, but there are ways now in this modern world that we can take a picture of ourselves and the computers know ways to make it look older. Or younger, if you're into that. I've seen that done too. That change is something that we can see artificially so that we can anticipate something happening in our lives over the course of time. Following Christ is all about change, as Paul says to us today. Life change, priority change, and a significant change in our allegiance. Not just our allegiance to the community around us or the leaders that we follow, but allegiance from ourselves to the needs of those around us. That's what this passage is all about. That's what Paul was impressing upon the church at Corinth The most obvious change, of course, in the life of a Christ follower is that Jesus makes in our lives a difference, a difference that allows us to be forgiven, gives us the power to leave sin behind. That forgiveness that comes by God's grace, grace being unmerited favor, something we can't earn, something we can't do enough to get a hold of, that grace that God brings into our life through Jesus Christ allows us to be transformed to be changed according to our need, according to the depth of our sin, according to the depth of our needs. We call that justifying grace, by the way, when Jesus comes into our lives and takes away that sin. And it comes on the heels of something that we in the United Methodist Church call prevenient grace, that grace that is given to us before we even know that we're getting it, before we even know that we need it. God at work in our lives, helping us to grow and to become to soften our hearts so that we might receive the words of Jesus Christ. But the main idea is that we change from sin to righteousness, from those old ways of doing things, from that that stinking thinking to being different. We go from sin to righteousness. We go from being dead to being alive. We go from being lost to being found. And that change allows us to embrace the kingdom of heaven. The embracing of the kingdom of heaven is something that we don't spend enough time talking about because that's really what Jesus was talking about. Most of his teachings were about the kingdom of heaven and what it means to live into that kingdom before we are a part of that kingdom, to bring about the beginnings of that change, to see the birth pangs happening around us, to see the old world passing away ever so slowly in ways that we can barely perceive. To see new things happening because it's God's will on earth as it is in heaven. I wish we had an app to make that visible. I wish we had a way to show that when it was brought to fruition. But if you think about it, that's exactly what Jesus did with parables. He gave us glimpses. He showed us what it would look like when the kingdom was made manifest in our lives. Following Christ is about change change in our hearts, 
a change in our lives. But today, today the, the biggest change is about our ability to change, to change from worrying about ourselves to focusing on the needs of others. And that's a hard move, church. It's a hard move for every church. It's difficult because we're taught to think that way. It's difficult because the world tells us that we still need everything that the church has to offer because the world wants us to think that we're broken. That's how they sell us stuff. That's how they move us, church. That's how they get us to do what they want us to do. They scare us to death, and then they promise that they're the only ones who can solve it, whether it's by buying their product or casting a ballot. The key change in any church, in any congregation, in any Sunday school class, in any disciple of Jesus Christ is the ability to adapt, to, a, to, to, to find and meet needs. And that's hard. That's hard. The world tells us we're broken and not beautiful, but God tells us that we have made that transition. God tells us that we go from being the helped to the helper, from the served to the servant, from the one who is the receiver to the one who is the giver. But we have a consumer mentality. We have a consumer mentality because the world wants us to feel that way. The world wants us to think that way. That's not good. We end up criticizing based on what we want. We're taught that Everywhere we go, where we put money in a plate or on a bill or whatever, that we, we are the ones who say what happens. And church isn't like that. We criticize based on what we want, not on what God asks of us. Just once, I would, I would love for someone to send me an angry letter that the church is not doing enough to help those who are impoverished. Just once I would like to get an angry phone call that we're not doing enough to provide life change and transformation for the people who are part of this congregation. Just once I would like to have that that heated debate in church council about what we're doing to raise up new disciples to refresh and, and instill our thinking, our doctrine, the precepts of Scripture just once. To those who are still broken, make no mistake, there is still healing for you. You can consume that. You can receive that. You can be served by that. But to those who have found healing, I'm speaking to you today. Alan Hirsch said this on social media. He said, you cannot build a church on consumers. They'll desert you at a moment's notice because they have no commitments beyond meeting their own needs. Jesus, though, can take 12 disciples and build a movement that changes the world. You can't do that with consumers, he says. Paul shows us how to make that transition in this passage from the ninth chapter of 1 Corinthians. He shows us how to move from thinking, me, 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 to thinking about them, 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 until you are thinking about us, us, us. Paul puts it in very clear formats here. There's a, a very parallel structure to this passage from Corinthians. First, he talks about the Jewish people, people of which Paul was one. Paul believed that he had an obligation to those who had kept the faith in the solid promises of the Old Testament. That obligation was to explain the fulfillment of those promises in new terms, in terms of Jesus Christ. To those who knew, he was able to identify with them because he knew those promises as well. He had studied them at the feet of the masters. He understood the law. He understood the Torah. He understood the prophets. He understood what was coming. And because he knew that language, he was able to identify them because he knew it. He had to help them adapt. He had to help them grow into that that, that fulfillment. Why? Because he had met them where they were so that they could meet Christ where he was. 
when Jesus comes into our midst, we don't always know how to recognize Jesus. Just like those people in the times of Jesus thought that he was supposed to be a great general or a king or a great high priest, and here he comes as a a traveling teacher, someone who eventually is arrested and put to death by the state for the way he taught and what he taught, that the kingdom of heaven would supersede the kingdoms of the earth. The kingdoms of the earth didn't like that. That didn't look like the Messiah they had been promised. It took someone who understood these teachings to speak these promises anew to the Jewish people. For those with Jewish heritage, for those with a grasp of Jewish history, Paul's ability to speak their language meant that the story of Jesus Christ was now available to them, understandable to them, meaningful to them. But Paul didn't stop there. He continued to speak not only to the Jewish people, but to those who were living their Jewish culture out under the law, under the Torah. Remember, Paul was a well-trained legal expert. He knew the Torah as well as anyone. To those people, he was able to make the case as one who could speak with authority. He had to help them adapt as well. He had to help them change. Why? So that they could change. He met them where they were so that they could meet Christ where he was. It's the same deal. It's the same thing. When we get excited about our traditions and we find ourselves caught up in those those unquenchable desires to keep things exactly the way they were when we first met Jesus, it takes someone who is familiar with those traditions, someone who is familiar with those laws to say, Think about how we got into them from the beginning. Think about how we got into those traditions from the very start and what drew us into them. We don't repeat them because they worked once. We repeat them because they are comfortable. And instead of looking to our traditions, we should look instead to Jesus and where Jesus is. Paul had to teach that to the Jewish people who were living under the law so that they could understand and see Jesus where Jesus was. Hold on to that thought, because for those who were under the law, Paul's Paul's ability to speak their language meant that the story of Jesus Christ was available to them, was understandable to them, and was meaningful to them. Do you see the pattern? For those who were outside the law, Paul recognized that the mandate of God's calling upon his life meant that he was sent beyond his own borders his own culture, his own comfort zone. Church, that's us. Paul went from the closed-off mindset of Pharisaic Judaism, laws, rules, things you had to do, and things you had to do when you stopped doing the things you had to do. He went from Pharisaic Judaism to a ministry of grace, unmerited favor. You can't earn it. You can't be obedient enough to deserve it. He ultimately went to the Gentiles with a message of inclusion. Come and be a part of what God is doing. Even though you're not a part of the chosen people, even though you don't know the cultures, even though you don't know the traditions, even though you don't know the laws, Paul had to adapt again. He had to change. Why? so that they could change. He met them where they were so that Jesus could be met where Jesus was. We have a hard time doing this, church. We have a hard time looking beyond our walls and seeing anything other than a broken and sinful world, and we've been taught to keep ourselves pure and to stay away from that, not to touch that, not to think about it, not to talk about it, not to go near it. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't chew, don't go with girls who do. Jesus is already out there out there on the edges, out there on the fringes, out there on the perimeter. We meet him here at the heart of the body of Christ, at the communion table. But then, when we go forth, we find ourselves out past the safe places, 
out past the, the rules and the laws and the traditions. And we find ourselves in a strange country, a faraway place like the prodigal son. Not because we have become the prodigal son, but because we go to meet that one who has fallen so low. For those who were outside the law, Paul's newfound ability to speak their language meant that the story of Jesus Christ was available to them was understandable to them, was meaningful to them. They didn't have the law. They needed Jesus. Paul also says that he becomes weak so that he could reach those who were weak. This is harder for us to get. You thought it was hard being outside the rules, outside the traditions, outside the culture, outside our comfort zone. Paul recognized that the promises of God to the second sons, to the tiny second-rate kingdom of Israel, to the second-class subjugated citizens of Israel and Judea who were languishing under Rome's boot heel, also applied to the weak and to the weary, wherever they were in the world. That's what the gospel is about. The broken and the battered, the least the last and the lost, even though they were never a part of the in crowd, even though they would never be a part of the in crowd, apart from the unmerited favor of God, God's grace and love. He had to show them that God was willing to adapt, and to lower the walls, to open the doors, to bring those people nearer through the heart of Jesus Christ. He had to show them that the rules had changed. Why? So that they could change. There's a pattern here if you're not picking it up. <laughs> he met them right where they were so that they could meet Christ where he was. And where he was was right in the middle of their suffering. Because like them, Jesus knew suffering. Like them, Jesus knew what it was like to be the last the least, but never the lost. For those who were weak and broken, Paul chose their suffering. Chose their suffering, church. This is where we're called. Chose their suffering in order to speak their language. And speaking their language of brokenness, their language of hurt and pain, speaking that language meant that the story of Jesus Christ was available to them, was understandable to them, and had become meaningful to them. Not a story of you get to be a part of this if you earn your way in, if you're a part of the right crowd, if you live in the right neighborhood, if you have the right heritage, the right lineage. Those who were outside of Judaism sometimes thought that they couldn't be a part of that, couldn't get to where that goodness of God was. Jesus changed all that, and Paul models all of that for us, church, so that we can do all of that. Why? <laughs> because Paul knew that the gospel wasn't some kind of magic ticket to ride, to wait for the Glory Land Express at the end of our days and hop on board and, and sail away to those streets of gold behind the pearly gates. That's not what Paul was promising. Paul was talking about life change. He was talking about the same thing that Jesus was talking about, life, and that life more abundant. Paul knew that the gospel was the fulfillment of God's promises, not just to God's people, but to all of God's children. Paul knew that Jesus was the long-awaited availability of those promises to those outside of power, outside the law, those who were under the law, and those who had been living with promises delayed, promises deferred. I point you back to the words of Isaiah that Jesus spoke at the beginning of Luke. I will never tire of reading these words because this is the thesis statement for the ministry of Jesus Christ. This is the beginning 
of the living out of the gospel. This is the fulfillment of the promise. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, Jesus says, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and the recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, unmerited favor, unmerited, unearned favor, grace. Jesus announces grace. And then he sets about living that grace, teaching that grace, sharing that grace, and dying to demonstrate that grace. What kept the kingdom from coming has always been us, church, our manifold sins. God can't stand to be in the presence of those sins, but God loves us so much he wants to be with us and wants us to be with him. What brought the kingdom near was the presence of the king in a guise that we could barely recognize. Had it not been for the guides like Paul, we might have never understood what was happening. Had it not been for Jesus teaching disciple after disciple that it's not the way you were expecting, it's better than that. We, may, we might never have known. What made the kingdom possible was the forgiveness of those sins that separated us from the kingdom, that separated us from the king, that separated us from the God whose promises had been available to us from the beginning, but we were unable to avail ourselves. They weren't available. That's the gospel. That God was willing to send his one and only son to die to provide us with an example to provide us with unmerited favor, to provide us with grace and forgiveness, to teach us righteousness, to transform us, and to make us whole. And church, I can't, I can't underline this for you in a sermon, but I want to emphasize this for you. Our transformation means the possibility of transformation for others because God justifies us and changes us with God's grace and then God grows us from provenient grace, from justifying grace on into sanctifying grace. What God does through us as we are sanctified and set apart and live differently and live better and live more like Jesus means that our lives impact those who are still living with prevenient grace. We become the means by which that grace comes into their lives. We become a means by which the gospel can be spoken to them. Our transformation can mean the difference for the people around us. But not if we're just consumers Asking why we can't have things our way. Asking why we can't do the things that we have always done. I know you want them. I do too. But even before all of this pandemic stuff, even before the restrictions, even before the decisions that we've had to make to, say, to keep people safe and to keep people healthy, there was a change coming, church. There was a change coming. Because Scripture demanded it. And we had stopped listening to Scripture, in this country anyway, and in a lot of other places around the world. We have to remember how to change. That is, we open ourselves up and we make ourselves available to the power of Jesus Christ, to the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit, to the love of God. Because in that transformation, we learn to speak the language of those who are called to embrace the law of love demonstrated by a self-sacrificing Savior. We have to learn to transform, to change where we are so that we can dwell among those who are outside of the law of love and invite them to dwell with us even as we make our place with them. Remember, the Gospel of John says that Jesus made his habitation, his dwelling place. He tabernacled among us. Never thought that would be a verb, but there it is. We must embrace the weak. We must embrace the broken. And just as Paul chose their suffering in order to speak their language, we must find their pain 
Perhaps we can find it within ourselves, having once been where some of them now are. Church, we have to learn to empathize once again. And by speaking their language of brokenness, their language of hurt, their language of pain, speaking that language will mean, as it has always meant, that the story of Jesus Christ is still available to them, still understandable to them, and still meaningful to them. Who will go? If not you, then who? If not now, then when? Jürgen Moltmann was the Gifford lecturer once upon a time. He's the former Woodruff chair at the Candler School of Theology where I was a student. He was there before I was 20 years ago. He's 94 years old now, and Jürgen Moltmann is on Twitter at the ripe old age of 94. He tweeted this this morning. There is only one way of protecting every single one of us. Solidarity with the first victim. Solidarity with the weakest among us. What affects them today will affect us tomorrow. So their skins are our own. What affects them today will affect us tomorrow. Or perhaps, if I may be so bold as to add to what he has said here, what affected us yesterday is affecting them today. We must change, church, as needs must be. Whatever the needs are, we must meet them. Not through our own power, but by our own willingness, our own pliability, our own ability to, to let God work through us, to stop saying no to the Holy Spirit, to teach Scripture instead of just pounding on the outside of a closed Bible to get our way. How is God calling you to change, church? As needs must be, so shall the church adapt and overcome in order to bring the gospel to those who need it most rather than just those who have heard it most often and then done little or even nothing with it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you pray with me and pray for me? Heavenly Father, we understand that this brokenness that Paul was addressing, this inability to change, is a part of who we are. It's a part of who I am. So the beginning is, of course, confession. Confession to our hesitation, to our recalcitrance, to our stubbornness. Mine. Take it from us, O oh God. And as we confess our sins before you, replace these broken places with the healing that comes only from you. We ask it for the sake of the Christ who makes this healing possible. Amen. If you are broken, if you are hurting, if you are in need of Jesus and you have heard that today or in the last week or the last month or the last year, but now you are ready to take the hand of Jesus Christ, please let us know how we can be a part of your decision to accept Christ and to follow him as his disciple. If you've done that in the past, but you realize now you've been holding back, holding on to that first moment, trying to recreate that first time you grabbed the horns of the altar, and claim the blood of Jesus Christ, but you have failed to live into that life of Jesus Christ, let today be the day you give the rest of your life to Jesus. If you're a part of another congregation, but you think maybe this might be the church for you, don't do anything, don't do a thing until you've talked to your pastor. Don't do a thing until you've talked to the members of your church, the people who sit near you and worship, the people with whom you go to Sunday school or Wednesday night Bible study. Talk to them, don't just leave. And once you have made your departure known, come talk to us if this is the place God is calling you. We will be eager to make you a part of the body of Christ that meets here virtually. And finally, if you just need to listen and pray, 
give yourself to God and receive God's gift of himself to you. As we sing our hymn of dedication, make me a captive, Lord. Verses one, two, and four. Buckley, will you lead us? Before our benediction today, I want to remind you that we are having parking lot communion. You'll want to come and keep your car running, keep the heater going. It is 25 minutes after the hour. We're scheduled for 1130. We're not going to make that because the preacher went a little long today. And I apologize for that only because it feels like I should, but I'm not really all that sorry. (laughs) So what I want to tell you is this. At 1145, on the parking lot here at Water Street, you'll be able to drive up and be a part of an outdoor service in which we share in the elements of communion. If you haven't left already, you can still make it if you're in the Mayfield area. We will see you in about 20 minutes out on the parking lot. Hear now the words of the benediction as Debbie Jaton speaks them aloud to us. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors.